right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Looking forward to talking to you today from sunny California, San Diego. Today I'm delighted to join, be joined by James Muir. How are you doing, James? Very good. And Great James, to be back. And James, you're over the East Coast, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. All right, and James is the founder and CEO of Best Practice International and the best-selling author of three books, including Unsticking Deals and the number one book on closing sales, The Perfect Close, 30-year veteran, extensive background uh, in healthcare where you sold the largest names in technology. And uh, and now what we're going to talk about today is the, is the new book here, and here it is here. <laughs> <laughs> Unsticking deal. You can even see my little marker. Some kind of a here. bookmark in there, yeah. Yeah, there is a bookmark in there because there's something really important that I want to talk about here. And uh, first of all, James, I think this book is long overdue because I think we spend so much time, um, we spend so much time talking about deals that have gone south or deals that have stalled or deals that have just disappeared. But we never seem to come to any real conclusions why we kind of seem to default to the old excuses of uh, maybe it was the price. Maybe they were just uh, testing us against somebody else. You know, maybe they were just information gathering or they weren't the right person in the company, probably, or a host of things. But we never really take a deep dive into why things stall. And it's, it, is the, it is the biggest thing that you get. I always say that in a, in a tough economy, your biggest competitor is no decision, right? It's hard enough to get in front of people, but then you get no decision. So just give me the genesis of, of this book, James. Well, when I wrote Perfect Close, people would call me and invite me out to talk to their organization about including, uh, improving close rates. Yeah. And... Um, and so we, you know, you'd start out a conversation and then, you know, you end up talking about discovery and targeting and all these other things. And mm -hmm. sometimes what they think is a closing problem really isn't a closing problem. It's a different problem. And, but, but of course, you know, at first glance, things aren't closing. So it must be a closing problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I discovered during all of that is that a huge number of these organizations have very large bloated pipelines full of stalled deals. And so I, I read a lot, um, probably a hundred books a year. And so I, I looked for books that I could send them that would, you know, um, hey, here, read this book. It'll explain to you how to unclog your pipeline. There is no such book out there that I could find. So I ended up just writing it myself for my clients so that I could send it and say, here you go. Here is a little um, follow this formula, diagnose what you're, you know, what's causing your deal to stick. And then here's some strategies on how to unstick it. Yeah, listen, it, it's great because, I mean, you mentioned bloated pipelines uh, a number of years back when I was uh, running Huthwaite and spin selling. Uh, we had this term called the feel good funnel. It's like, you know, but whereas, and the feel good funnel is where you have loads of stuff in stage one or two, like loads of stuff. Maybe you're having difficulty closing and, you know, your final stages, but you can always say, James, listen, I know things are a bit tough right now. But in three months time, whoa, look at the amount of business that's coming down. <laughs> and then three months time, I come back and I say, yeah, I know I said that, James, and you know it didn't pan out. But three months time, I've got an even bigger pipeline now. And it basically means that you're just fooling yourself by loading as much stuff into, into the early stages as you can to kind of offset because you think it's a numbers game. And this is what's often propagated, but I don't believe it is a numbers game. No, it's not. In fact, um, I, I know this is not what the focus of our session today. But as a, I'm an, I'm an, I have a day job. I manage a sales team, just like mm -hmm. a, yeah, everybody else listening to this uh, show. And I like to use empirical data on co closure, on conversions, to do everything. And so I don't let salespeople tell me what percentage of a chance they think their deal is going to close. I just look empirically on what it mm -hmm. is, and that's how we calculate pipeline uh, and the need for pipeline. Yeah, but there you go. I mean, as a, as a sales leader, you're focused uh, on early stage stuff, uh, and a lot of them, unfortunately, are not. But let's get into your book because I was really, really struck by the part about about sales issues that uh, that are that are contributing towards deals getting stuck. Because, like I said, I mean, we always tend to go, "Oh, it's it's not me, it's them," 
Uh, but let's look at us and let's see what are the, what are some of the sales issues that are contributing towards um, towards not being able to close deals. Sure. Well, there's just three things that causes deals to stick, and sales issues is the first of those. And within that, there's five things. Now, there's more than five ways that sales so sales issues are issues that, that you have caused in the way that you ran your sales process mm -hmm. that have caused you to stall your own deal. Right. And so that's why we start there. But the number one top of the list by far is bad targeting. It's just you you started selling to someone who you actually shouldn't have been selling to at all. And what sometimes happens to me and this, by the way, happens especially to uh, brand new salespeople because mm -hmm. they don't know what a good target looks like. So they'll just go after anything that moves. Right. And so they'll spend all this time on the account. And then finally, when the deal stalls out, because it really was never a very good match to begin with. Then they'll come to me and say, hey, James, tell me the magic thing I can say that will cause this bad target to buy our software or buy our solution, right? Mm -hmm. And the truth is it won't happen. You have to have discipline at the very beginning part of the process to target correctly. So that's the first one. Um, wrong or incomplete stakeholders is the second mistake that we make in our sales process. Uh, champion management, relationship management, and the fifth one is competition. Those are the five, mm -hmm. like those five taken together represent easily more than eighty percent of all of the um, deals that are stalled due to sales issues. So, James, an interesting, you know, you just said there about the ideal target customer because I feel like a lot, a lot of companies spend an, an inordinate amount of time and they get, you know, targeting, get their ICP and everything. Maybe they create personas, they do all of this work, and yet it still seems that when they go to market, they still chase after the wrong the wrong kind of targets or they kind of shoehorn them thinking, yeah, well, it's not quite it, but it's sort of it. So if I shoehorn it in here, maybe. It... So why is there this, this disparity between the amount of work the companies do on ideal target customers and the reality when they go to market? I think salespeople get happy ears and they're like, and they would much <laughs> rather talk to someone who's already engaged. They'd rather react to someone who's talking to them than to go out and proactively find someone who's an ideal customer. In general, mm. they prefer, you know, engaging someone to prospecting. And so they'll let those deals sneak in and you got to have, you know, what happens is it's, it's not bad to lose a deal as long as you get, you don't spend any time on it. Right. right? It's, it's when you power, pour hours and hours and hours into it. And then you've, you know, and then you don't get it. Then that, then it's a colossal waste of time because mm -hmm. you've spent 10 times the amount of time you should have on it. Yeah. And, and not just your own time. You've just wasted the, the prospects time. I mean, maybe they have time to waste. I don't know, but you've also wasted their time too. Um, the interesting one on, on you just mentioned on stakeholders, because I feel like this is another really incredibly important one is oftentimes, as you said, you know, we like to talk to somebody who is engaged, who maybe is enthusiastic, maybe has read up on us, loves our product and everything. And we get so enamored with them that we're afraid to start really probing as to whether they're the right person, whether whether I need to go above them, whether I need to go to the side of them, I need to get them. And we kind of back off a little because we don't want to kind of upset this relationship. But this relationship may take us nowhere. That's right. All right. And so I, I, my, I have a preference. I like to start at the top and then get delegated down. And if you mm -hmm. do that, you can make that first person you talk to an executive sponsor, which you then, then can use at any time to unstick your deal at will, mm -hmm. right? But if you don't do that and you're trying to get sponsored up, then there's some techniques you have to use to first identify who are all your stakeholders you should be talking to. And, and then the second is how do you get access to all of those stakeholders? And probably the third issue that salespeople deal with is feeling comfortable talking to the different stakeholders. Um, and there's st strategies in the book for all, all three of those things. Mm -hmm. And and the interesting thing, as you just said there, is identifying, because I feel like this is another area. And that's why we put... Uh, you know, we we put into pipeline or CRM is the buying center and the relationship mapping and all that. So you can visually build out because an org chart and a buying and, and the buying map are not the same. An org chart's hierarchical, whereas a buying chart, you, James, may be middle management in the organization, but you actually hold the budget and the decision on something. But I'm focused over here on some senior VP because I'm thinking hierarchically instead of thinking strategically. Yeah, the, the big mistake with the hierarchy instead of the our actual influence is any sufficiently influential stakeholder can cause your deal to stick. Mm -hmm. And so that does if, if it's an operational person that's using it, then and you don't know that, then you've got a sort of a problem. And so yeah, I'm sure you've read it. There's a, a big part of the book where you're trying we're trying to figure out how do you find who yeah. the stakeholders are and then how do we um map them out and then how do we use those uh 
uh, our understanding of that stakeholder to create a strategy to create a win for each one of mm -hmm. them. Yeah, and, and I think part of it too is, I mean, wherever you make your entree into the organization initially is is that is that whole research piece. Because, like I said, when you connect with one person and they seem enthusiastic, we tend to get like a bit of tunnel vision on it. But also, if they're engaging with you, then they're a great source of information if you're elegant in how you extract it. A hundred percent. And uh, but the thing is, that's just one coach. Let's just mm -hmm. even give them the credit and say that that is a coach. But you're probably going to need to know exactly what, I mean, sometimes your coach will tell you, hey, what do you think the CFO is going to think about this? Mm -hmm. And they give you their idea. But on the other hand, you say, hey, does it make sense for me to spend 15 minutes? Because it, they seem like it's going to be important for us to get their input and feedback on this project. And then they, you can get that person to sponsor you to all the people that you need to get to. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that, I mean, and again, uh, especially now with all technology, et cetera, you know, we're... We have to rem remember at the the essence of sales, particularly B two B complex. You know, sales are consultative selling. <clears throat> it's still people, right? It's still people to people selling, and all the technology can help and augment, and it can do a lot of things for you. But it's that. But understanding the dynamics of a relationship and understanding uh, the needs of that, per understanding the organization, these are very very human things. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that, yeah, it, regardless of the role that the person is, they still put their pants on one leg mm -hmm. at a time, just like you do. So they're very, they're very human people. I do think that salespeople in general could do a better job of understanding the dynamics that each role plays and, and uh, knowing how to relate to them so that they can speak the language of that type of stakeholder. If you go to a CEO and you start talking about IT stuff, they're going to immediately say, "Hey, I don't, I don't know anything about yeah. that. Let me, let me, let me delegate you to this other guy who knows all about that stuff." And so you made a mistake there because that's an important stakeholder, and you want it. So you need to know how to, at least, you know, at a, to a certain level, you need to be able to know how to speak their language. Yeah, and also uh, assess their assess their communication style and how they receive information because like you said i mean if you if you're talking high level to a very detail oriented person you're talking across each other if you're talking very detailed to somebody who just wants the net of everything again you're talking so part of it too is understanding that you have to communicate differently to different stakeholders 100%, 100%. And your own team also. So mm -hmm. I, I, I mentioned in the book, there's a, we have this one IT guy, uh, for those who don't know, I'm spending my whole year in healthcare, uh, mm -hmm. whole life in healthcare IT. Um, we had a guy that did interfaces and this guy was just such a caustic person that every time he would get on with a customer, it would literally kill our deal. So we finally actually hired a guy to deal with that because he was hurting our sales so much. And so uh, sometimes the easiest fix for a stalled deal is just a personnel, a personality transplant. Just take the person out. Sometimes that's you, by the way, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're not getting along with people, replace yourself with someone else who can, you know, have good chemistry with the customer so you can keep the ball moving. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point for everybody to take on board because it's uh, it's unrealistic that we're going to click with everybody. It, it doesn't happen in your personal life. It doesn't happen in your journey through life. So why it would happen in this environment that you would always click with people and you're right, sometimes maybe having somebody else who's got a different personality or whatever is, is right for that person. Um, but that means we have to I guess exercise a little bit of humility. Jim. That's right. Yeah. And that's hard for some salespeople, right? Yeah. You have to have a high, high EQ to recognize, oh, yeah. wait a minute, I'm not getting along with this person. I need to send somebody mm -hmm. else in there. Yeah. I also think the other thing that sometimes uh, happens, uh, and you talk about it too, is 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 how to deal with competition within it, right? Because sometimes you know, we engage and we think we're in pole position and everything, and then suddenly maybe competitors are revealed to us, or maybe they're brought in late. The worst one is when they're brought in late because because the CEO said, I need a comparison or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we get totally discombobulated and kind of off our game. So how do you handle things like that? Well, so I have some very, um, well, I'd say, uh, alternative thinking around uh, uh, how to deal with competition in there. But maybe the, before I say anything, I'll just say there's kind of three kinds of competition. There's status quo, that is doing mm -hmm. nothing, yep. right? Which is everybody's biggest competitor. There's alternate investments, meaning they might use the same money they're going to invest in your solution and something totally different that has nothing to do with your solution. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, a similar type of solutions that you do. 
when most people think about competition, they think about that third one, right? And so they totally ignore the first two. And unfortunately, that's a those first two are huge competitors to what we do. And so, uh, in fact, um, statistically, it's probably the biggest, uh, mm -hmm. um, right? It's between 40 and 60% are going to be those two. Um, so in terms of how to deal with competitors, the real answer is just to differentiate on value. Instead of trying to talk about the details or the specifics of your solution, which is the how you solve, you, you'd be better off focusing time on uh, the results that you deliver and making sure that the customer knows they're going to get those results. So I say it this way, you know, a lot of salespeople spend a lot of time differentiating their solution when they would really be better served differentiating their results. Mm -hmm. So how do you do? So I mean, that's a that's a great point because oftentimes they'll get you know it's a standard it's a standard prospect question back to you, isn't it? Like, well, how do you compare with this and how do you compare with that and yeah. and that and that kind of and then that kind of forces you or you think I've got to go into a direct comparison here uh, rather than doing what you're doing. So how do you get around that when somebody just goes, oh, well, well, how are you compared to this? And what, how do you differentiate? So the first thing is, guys, it has been studied up and down and every side you can think of. Um, being derogatory towards your uh, mm -hmm. competitors does not work. It always, always backfires. Yep. And so don't ever do it. So if they say, how do you compare, then you you can say what you know, which is, hey, I, they're a great company. I think you know they do good work for a lot of people. We do have some philosophical differences in how we approach things, and then you can also say, well, you know, I know our solution pretty good, but I, I don't know theirs nearly as good, and so I wouldn't be able to speak to the very you know specific details about how the solution itself is different. But I know that we deliver. Uh, results, and then you're going to talk about your philosophy and the results that you deliver, and get off of the solution because it, mm -hmm. it's hard. I know it's hard, tough medicine, but they they don't care about your solution. They only care about the results that it delivers. So you spend way less time on the how you're getting the results and more on the results themselves. And so if, if you, for example, if you uh, if you are offering a guarantee of some kind of results, well, you're better off spending time talking about the results that they're going to get and the guarantee that goes with it than the the minutia of how your solution works because um the the solution is a detail to them yeah right and oftentimes they ask you that question and they don't really know how any of the solutions work um, it's kind of just a, a throwaway or something that they think they should ask uh, so tell me then uh let's talk a little bit about the one we talked about, the biggest competitor, and that's the indecision within a within an organization. And as I said, I think during during times of recession or economic downturn, that that no decision gets more and more. Um, so how do you how do you approach that? So uh, the uh, the important thing to remember is that somewhere about halfway through the sales cycle, the rules change, right? So at the beginning of the sales cycle, you're trying to sell change, right? Why should I change? What's the upside? And then what happens is somewhere in the middle of that process, the customer starts thinking, you know, I probably should change. And then a whole new thing happens, which is they go, oh my gosh, what if we do change? What mm -hmm. happens now? And then they start thinking through the ramifications of, well, what if they get it wrong? What if they make a mistake? And there's something called omission bias. And the short version of that is people are much more afraid uh, are worried about make, committing something, doing something that actually fails than they are about missing out on the upside. Yeah. And so the classic mistake that salespeople do when they're trying to, like customer goes silent or they seem to be stalled, they can never really get to the next step. You may still be selling change. Why change? When in reality, what you need to change is you need to sell, your message needs to be, you can't fail. Right. And so you need to flip instead of, you know, if you keep selling, you should change, you should change, you should change. It's not really feeding the concern. The concern is, mm -hmm. what if I make a mistake? And so you need to flip your whole motive to, um, to uh, we, we have a lot of supporting resources that are going to help you, or we've got a recipe that always works, and those kinds of things that assure them. Uh, you can talk about guarantees. All things like that um, will um, help them get through this whole part where they're uncertain about what the outcome is going to be. And so you need to work on outcome certainty uh, to address that. You know. The, st the stall that's causing them to um, to drag their feet. Yeah, no, because it's interesting because, um, you know, there's obviously the fear of it failing. Sometimes there's even, and this is the more bizarre one, and it happens more than one would think uh, in life, is the fear of success. And you think, well, why would you be afraid of success? But you think, well, 
if this works out, then maybe I'll, ha I'll, I'll need more people. I'll have to do this. Maybe sure. I'll have a higher profile, you know, maybe I, and I kind of like flying under the radar or this. And, and so there are often things like where people say, yeah, if it fails, this could happen to me. But also, well, if this succeeds, it could change things too. And I just don't like change. And I, and I think you're right. I think that, that being able to frame it in, in that, you know, you can't fail, that these issues are only going to work in your favor and all of this kind of thing. But I think those are really good things to be aware of. Yeah, there's a lot of practical ways that you can uh, address outcome uncertainty, and uh, we give those in the book. Um, so depending on your sale, you're going to have a different set of tools that you can use to assure them. You know, but pretty much every company or industry or salesperson can use you know, referenceable clients, you, you, mm -hmm. you can use social proof, other people that have proven that it can be done. Those are all great ways of demonstrating that, um, that the outcome is sure. And then if you actually have the ability to, to offer uh, guarantees, then that's a, a very strong thing that you can do to overcome outcome uncertainty. And then uh, probably the holy grail is to literally only sell results, meaning you take a contingency on the upside that uh, you're delivering for the customer, which means you make no money if they don't succeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, now if you're in that kind of a business where you can get away with that, it's like the holy grail because yeah. truly the solution is a very small detail in a scenario like that. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, just before we go, James, one more. But if there's one thing that you would advise out of every out of all this thing, number one, I would say get the book because I think this is really timely and overdue book. But if there's one thing you can do this year as a salesperson to help prevent uh, stalling deals, what would it be? Well, I would understand that dynamic that I just gave you, which is that, um, well, the, the first thing is your sales process is causing the majority of your stuck deals. So if you fix that, you'll fix, uh, you'll you'll unclog your pipeline. The second though is just client indecision. If you just understand that customers are worried about actually making a choice and that there's this fear, like you said, of either success or maybe could something could go wrong, then you change the way you sell. And, and, and that makes a huge difference um, in terms of, if you've got clients that are still talking to you, but still not going anywhere, that's that's what the issue is. If they're not talking to you, then it's something else probably. And yeah. there's a, we, we give you some ways of going after that. But there you go. You get you get two for one. Perfect, perfect. Listen, uh, all of James' information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Sure. Well, I'm actually a SVP of sales for a $40 million revenue cycle management company. I have a day job. That's what I do. I manage a sales team. And then it is a labor of love for me to uh, work with other organizations on um, – you know, closing, sometimes uh, unsticking deals or uh, sales process or discovery. Um, those are, uh, I can maybe only do six of those a year. Or so, but uh, I'm a real world in the streets salesperson, mm -hmm. just like you are. So uh, hopefully that comes out when you read the book, that is a very practical advice. Yeah, no. And that makes a big difference uh, because it's like anything else in life. You know, we, you could be, you know, a former salesperson or a former sales leader and yeah, you've got a lot of experience, but the further removed you get from that job, uh, you know, the kind of less relevant your your advice can become. Unfortunately, that's just the reality of life. So here we have somebody who's living it every day. And as I said, this is the book on sticking deals. Uh, I would encourage everybody to go check it out. So thanks again, James. Thank you for watching, listening. Yeah.